welcome you all to MSP lecture series on advanced transformational chemistry. This is the 10th lecture in the series. In my previous lecture, I was discussing about uh, the coordination concept uh, brought out by uh, very systematic and meticulous uh, experiments with critical and analytical evaluation of his own work, Alfred Werner and how nicely he postulated uh, uh, coordination theory when a time uh, there was no methodology or any instrumental facilities or any spectroscope means that was available for him to convincingly uh, understand uh, the futures of uh, coordination compounds. Nevertheless, whatever the postulations he made uh, by emphasizing for quantitative understanding was proved to be precisely correct later with the experimental and uh, spectroscopic evidences. Uh, once coordination chemistry uh, started evolving, uh, people started looking into various bonding concepts to explain uh, how to characterize compounds and how to explain the bonding that happens between metal ions or metal atoms and ligands. In that context, let us look into early bonding concepts. Before that, let us look into few points about uh, what are the factors that affect coordination number. The size of the central atom or ion has an influence on coordination number uh, because if the size is larger, it can accommodate more ligands surrounding it as a result. Uh, coordination number can be more. Steric interactions between bulky ligands is also quite important. Uh, despite the size of the metal is appropriate to have 4 or 6 ligands, if the ligand size is much bigger like triphenylphosphine, it is very difficult to accommodate 4 ligands. In that context, steric interactions uh, are very, very important and steric bulk of the ligands plays a major role in deciding the coordination number of a metal ion. Uh, the electronic structure of the metal atom or ion is also equally important. If the oxidation number is high, the metal can accept more electrons from the ligands that is Lewis base because uh, it has more empty orbitals. Metals with many d electrons will have lower coordination number. That is the reason when we go for to late transfer metals after d6 electronic configuration, the coordination number, the tendency to have less coordination number will be more pronounced compared to early metals which have a tendency to have a large number of ligands surrounding it. So now let us look into some uh, uh, methodologies developed uh, to explain bonding. By that time, coordination chemistry was evolving after a systematic understanding from Werner's coordination theory, uh, people began looking into bonding concepts. As I said, by the time main group chemistry had very interesting concepts such as VSCPR theory, valence bond theory to explain the structure and bonding among main group elements. And same strategy was uh, uh, attempted to expand or extend to uh, coordination compounds. In that context, electron neutrality principle developed by Pauling is very, very important. Pauling's electron neutrality principle is an approximate method of estimating the charge distribution in molecules and complex ions. What it states is the distribution of charge in a molecule or ion is such that the charge on any single atom is within the range of plus 1 to minus 1, ideally close to 0. So that means uh, in a metal complex, all species involved should have a charge between plus 1 and minus 1, ideally close to 0. This is what uh, the definition of electron neutrality principle. To test this principle, let us consider one well-known example hexamine cobalt 3 plus ion. So I am considering hexamine cobalt 3 plus ion, let us look into first. Uh, covalent method. If you consider covalent method, we have 9 electrons in the valence shell that is uh, 3d7 4s2 and assume that 6 electrons are used for covalent bonding. 
leaving 3 charge on cobalt that means out of 9 electrons from the valence orbital of cobalt utilize 6 for making covalent bond with amine or ammonia ligands. So, that 3 electrons will be left and that should be considered as 3 minus charge on cobalt. Uh, this is the first assumption using covalent model. So, this is simply unrealistic as cobalt cannot be negatively charged owing to its positive electro positive nature. We all know that in this one since it is positively charged it is not uh, very appropriate to assume as negatively charged. So, owing to this okay, this covalent model was ruled out. So, this is how uh, the covalent model was depicted out of 9 electrons 6 are utilized for making the bond with ammonia and leaving 3 as excess considered as negative charges. So, that now we have a charge distribution like this. This uh, is simply unrealistic. So, uh, let us look into ionic model. So, plus 3 charge remains localized. Uh, we have 3 plus charge. So, cobalt is in plus 3 state. So, uh, ionic model assumes that plus 3 charge remains localized on cobalt and 6 uh, ammonia ligands remain neutral. Again this is flawed because the experimental evidence shows that the complex ion remains intact in solution or retains its identity in solution. That means a complex ion is not a double salt uh, that fact we know uh, because here primary valency, secondary valency everything is clearly spelled out. So, uh, and the electrostatic interactions implied by the ionic model are unlikely to be enough to all these things to happen. So, that means uh, if you just consider that cobalt 3 plus remains as an entity in that case what happens if you put into solution okay, they disintegrate. So, that is not going to happen as a result ionic model was also overruled. So, this is how uh, the ionic model was assumed. It appears, it appears like uh, a double salt and in uh, solution it will disintegrate. Since that is not the case, this is also overruled. Then came electron neutrality model. What it says is we know the net charge on the metal center should be 0 or between plus 1 minus 1 close to 0. So, that is cobalt 3 plus ion may accept a total of only 3 electrons from 6 ligands giving the charge distribution shown here. I am going to show you the electron neutrality principle results in a bonding description for the complex having 50 percent ionic character and 50 percent covalent character. So, this is what the electron neutrality uh, principle means that means if you see the charge distribution all on all entities is well within plus 1 to minus 1 and cobalt being 0 here. Now, using this method let us try to understand one more problem. So, let us consider hexacyanoferrate a realistic charge distribution results in each ligand carrying a charge of minus 2 by 3. In this model what charge does the Fe center carry and why is this charge consistent with the electron neutrality principle. That means, whatever the example we saw from hexamine cobalt 3 plus let us try to extend same analogy to this one uh, okay, in which ligands carrying a charge of minus 2 by 3. So, that means uh, here each cyanide is carrying a charge of minus 2 by 3 and that means we have now 6 cyanide ligands are there. So, this will be minus 4. Okay. If it is minus 4, now if you consider Fe 3 plus we have 5 electrons, 5 minus 4 equals plus 1. So, in this one uh, Fe carries plus 1 charge. So, according to electron neutrality principle, uh, the charge carried by iron center is plus 1. Let us look into another uh, uh, problem here. If the bonding in CrO4 2 minus were described in terms of a 100 percent ionic model, what would be the charge carried by the chromium center and explain how this charge distribution can be modified by the introduction of covalent character into the bonds. That means, we have to examine this example. 
uh, chromate 2 minus using both 100 percent ionic model and also a covalent model. If you just look into 100 percent ionic model, ionic model okay, the CR O4 2 minus here charge will be minus 2. Okay, in this case uh, the charge will be minus 2 here, but if you consider covalent model, so 6 electrons are there and these 6 electrons are utilized in making 6 uh, metal to ligand bonds according to electron neutrality principle. In that case what happens number of electrons left on chromium will be 0, so that here the charge on chromium will be 0. Next, after successfully applying VSCPR theory uh, to explain bonding among main group compounds, okay, attempts were made by Keppert uh, to utilize VSCPR theory to explain bonding in transfer metal complexes. So, for this one, uh, following examples were considered, and here, like all six coordinated compounds but having different valence shell electronic configuration were considered. For example, vanadium uh, 3 plus uh, has 2 d electrons and manganese 3 plus has 4 electrons and then cobalt 3 plus has 6 electrons and then hexo aqua, aqua nickel 2 plus has d 8, 8 electrons and zinc hexa aqua zinc okay, here uh, we have 3 d 10 4 s 2. So, 10 electrons are there. That means, uh, we are considering examples of uh, vanadium, manganese, cobalt, nickel and zinc having octahedral geometry homolytic hexa aqua compounds, but having different electrons left in their d orbitals. That means, d 2, d 4, d 6, d 8 and d 10. However, each of these species has an octahedral arrangement of ligands that we know in spite of having different electron configuration. So, obviously, if you go by VSCPR theory to count all electrons, VSCPR theory cannot explain the bonding among D block metal complexes. As a result, some assumptions were made in VSCPR theory to accommodate the explanation of bonding in D block element complexes. So, what is the assumption that was made? Metal lies at the center of a sphere and the ligands are free to move around the surface of the sphere. So, that means metal assume as a sphere and the ligands are free to move about the surface of the sphere okay, and occupy positions as far away from each other as possible to minimize repulsion between the ligands. The ligands are considered to repel one another similar to those in VACPR model. Okay where we were using steric numbers, but unlike VSCPR model, Kepert model ignores non-bonding electrons and assumes coordination geometry of a d block species is independent of ground state electronic configuration of the metal center. So, this is assumption uh, according to their convenience, they postulated this assumption to employ VSCPR model to explain bonding in coordination uh, complexes. Okay. So, as a result what happens ions of the type okay, MLN M plus or MLN M minus irrespective of their cationic in nature or anionic nature if the number of ligands are same they are bound to have the same geometry. Again we know that this cannot be used uh, due to various reasons because most of the complexes if you look into its geometry, reactivity, properties and everything depends on the electronic configuration the oxygen state and many other factors. As a result, this initially made early method called Keppert model to employ VSCPR theory uh, did not work well. Keppert model rationalizes the shapes of D block metal complexes okay, and by considering the repulsion between the groups L, okay, lone pairs of electrons are totally ignored. Uh, and here also if two ligands are there, they propose linear geometry, if three ligands are there, they propose trigonal planar geometry, if four ligands are there, they consider tetrahedral geometry 
and 5 are there square pyramidal or trigonal bipyramidal geometry and for 6 octahedral geometry. So, what they did was the number of ligands surrounding the metal ion was considered as steric number ignoring the electrons present non bonded electrons present in d orbital. Then it is bound to show uh, results very similar to uh, main group elements, but certainly it does not explain and, and then when we have different type of ligands it can further deviate as a result it was concluded that Kepert model is not a suitable model uh, okay, and VSCPR theory is not a suitable theory to explain bonding in coordination compounds. So, example they, they showed uh, this uh, tris or tricinocuprate that we can use VSCPR theory ignoring uh, the d electrons to uh, arrive at uh, the geometry of course here trigonal planar geometry is correct, but citing one or two example it is not an ideal way to accept the model. So, now let us uh, look into the bonding concepts that were later used to explain okay, bonding in transmetal complexes. Uh, the first one was valence bond theory, it was proposed in 1930 by Linus Pauling uh, and he brought hybridization concept to explain bonding and also a couple of properties and uh, using this bonding he could explain inner orbital complex, outer orbital complex, similarly high spin complex and low spin complex and only spin only magnetic moment. So, in fact, when uh, Linus Pauling wrote his uh, very famous and popular book Nature of Bonding, he gave emphasis for his uh, theory and demonstrated uh, giving importance to the recognizing magnetic properties of transmetal complexes using valence bond theory. But however, it can predict spin only magnetic moment and beyond that many other properties including color and effective uh, magnetic moment, geometrical distortions all those things Linus Pauling's uh, valence bond theory could not explain. As a result people were looking for an alternate that time Christofield theory was proposed by Baith and Van Vlick mainly based on electrostatic forces. Uh, that means if you take a metal ion and uh, when you put a metal ion into the electric field generated or originated from ligands what happens uh, the degeneracy of orbital uh, will be twofold and this is how this work was started and then uh, early uh, electrostatic uh, uh, interactions and their utility was mentioned by Bakurel who is uh, known for uh, discovery of radioactivity along with uh, Marie Curie and Pierre Curie for which he got a Nobel Prize in 1903. Crystal field theory looks very ideal and here it explains uh, uh, different type of interactions between metal and ligand. If the metal is uh, cationic and ligand is anionic then one can talk about ion ion interaction and if the metal is cationic and the ligand is neutral uh, one can bring ion dipolar interaction. And but if the metal is neutral and ligands are neutral like what we see in case of uh, uh, zero valent metal carbonyl uh, compounds such as chromium hexacarbonyl, iron pentacarbonyl where metal is neutral and ligand is also neutral in that case we have to bring or uh, evoke dipolar dipolar interaction. Unfortunately, crystal field theory does not explain the bonding. Uh, arising out of dipolar dipolar interaction when the metal is neutral and ligands are neutral okay that was the only limitation and later uh, to accommodate this dipolar dipolar interaction the covalency was included and accommodated in crystal field theory and that become ligand field theory and ligand field theory is a beautiful theory it is a very nice combination of molecular orbital theory crystal field theory and also to an extent valence bond theory the advantage of crystal field theories it can explain absorption spectra that means color of complexes and it can explain uh, magnetism and also it can explain geometrical distortions and also relative stability because it brings a spectrochemical series and gives definite position in the spectrochemical series for a ligand to say whether it is a strong field ligand or a weak field ligand 
and, and bonding in neutral complexes was also brought through ligand field theory and overall molecular orbital theory explained bonding in all type of complexes whatever the bonding molecular orbital theory presently we are using is nothing but ligand field theory having uh, good parts of all these theories valence bond theory and Mullikan's molecular orbital concept and also crystal field theory very nicely developed by Beeth and Van Blake. Okay. And it is a very complete theory and it may appear like uh, uh, time consuming, but nevertheless it can give you lit literally all information that is needed uh, to understand the reactivity or their application in various aspects. So, before we start uh, digging deep into these bonding concepts. Uh, it is better to understand the shapes of the orbitals and their relative orientation in space. So, we know that uh, S is spherically symmetrical and we have P x orbital dumbbell shaped P y and P z they are orthogonal to each other and then we have D x z, D y z and D z square and D x minus y square and D x y. So, these 5 D orbitals are there. So, S orbitals are spherically symmetrical and their orientation does not affect bonding, but in a in a bond involving p orbitals, d orbitals or f orbitals, the orbitals will be oriented in a direction that maximizes the overlapping. So, that means their orientation matters. If oriented in a direction does not maximize overlap, the bond will be weaker. Let us start looking into valence bond theory. Uh, let me tell you about the central theme of valence bond theory. I am sure most of you are familiar with valence bond theory. The space generated due to the overlapping of orbitals has a maximum capacity of accommodating two electrons with opposite spins. That means, when you overlap uh, orbitals from two atoms okay, that can accommodate two electrons with opposite spins. That means, between two orbitals essentially electrons are localized. Uh, that is the first concept. If the overlapping is greater, the bond formed is stronger and more stable. Bond strength depends on attraction of the nuclei for the shared electrons. That means, if the overlapping is greater, uh, that means if the electronegativity com is comparable and the size of the orbitals are comparable, then okay, these two nuclei can come very close to each other and establish a bond in that case what happens the bonds will be much stronger. When two atoms combine to form a covalent bond, the valence orbital present in each atom overlap to form new hybrid orbitals with different shapes from the original S, P, D, R, F orbitals from which they are made up of. That means, before two atoms combine to form a covalent bond, the valence orbital in each atom overlap to form a new set of uh, orbitals called hybrid orbitals that carries the properties of okay, all the orbitals involved in that hybridization. For example, if you consider the sp hybridization uh, in that one, uh, one s and one p involved so that sp hybrid orbit would have 50 percent s character and 50 percent p character and this is how it goes. And in sp2 what happens? We have one third s character and two third p character. Whereas, in case of sp3 hybrid orbitals, we have 1 fourth s character and 3 fourth p character. That means, 25 percent s character and 75 percent p character. That means, valence bond theory uses the concept of hybridization of atomic orbitals prior to the bond formation. Okay. Uh, a covalent bond forms when orbitals of two atoms overlap and the overlap region which is between the nuclei is occupied by a pair of electrons. This is an important concept. Okay, that was proposed by valence bond theory. One is hybridization con concept and the second one is uh, concentration of electrons with opposite spin between the two atoms are, that are combined okay, or two nuclei. Okay. Uh, that means, it gives emphasis for localization of electrons between the two atoms. Okay. Let me stop uh, at this stage and continue in my next lecture more discussion and with more examples on valence bond theory.